June the 20th, 2008. My dear son, Jake, you're only a few years away from being a man. Because of that, I want to take a moment to write down how much I love you, how proud I am of you, and I want to let you know how thankful I am that God gave you to me to be my son. I will never forget the day you were born. It was a really hard labor. It took your mom 18 hours to give birth to you. And when you finally got here, honestly, you looked really beat up. But it didn't take long that you became very handsome like your father. In all seriousness, I couldn't be more proud to be your dad. Son, you're turning 13 soon. And if you will walk with me, I will walk with you through your teenage years. I promise to do four things. Number one, I will prepare you for the battles of life you're going to face. There will be many. Number two, I will prepare you to love the woman that you will one day marry. Number three, I will prepare you to one day be a godly father so that you can raise a godly family. And number four, I will help you discover God's plan and calling on your life. Son, I'm giving you this sword today. I have it engraved with the definition of a real man to commemorate the day you were called into manhood. It's a reminder that every man was born to battle and every man is called to be a warrior. A real man rejects passivity. He accepts responsibility. He leads courageously and expects the greater reward, God's reward. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Jake, pick up your sword. Come join me in battle and let's play the man. I love you. Dad. And that little baby Jake is now 28. He's been married five years. I mean, that is how fast it goes. And this series has gone almost that fast. This is the last sermon out of our Castle series, a family series. And what you just heard was me reading a letter that I had written to my son as he was going into seventh grade. I've written letters to my kids over the years at important moments in their life. I hope that you'll do the same. We've talked about castles because every castle is to be somebody's home. Every home is to be somebody's castle. And at this very moment, your home is either a sandcastle story. Jesus said the sand will wash away. The foundation is in erosion and decay. Or you're going to build a castle made out of rock. The Lord Jesus Christ that's going to last forever. 6,500 days. That's it. That's about all we get. 6,500 days from the time our children are born to shape them, aim them, and release them into the world. Psalm 127 verse 4, as arrows are in the hands of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. In the ancient days, you had to shape your arrow. You had to make your arrow. If that arrow was going to fly straight, the implication is clear. We have to shape them, and ultimately we have to aim them, and one day we will release our children into the world. We have about 6,500 days to do that from the time they're born to the time they graduate and leave our home. It may sound like a long time, but I'll promise as one having been there, it is but a short time and is worth whatever it takes. Castles in some way should be what we embody in all of our homes, and all of our families. This is St. Michael's Castle. It's actually named after St. Michael the Archangel. Now what's amazing to me about this castle off the shores of Normandy in France is it is more than a thousand years old. You can go there today, and a thousand years from now, it will still be there. Unlike a sand castle that will wash away, this castle is a place of fortification. You can see why it is still there. It was built in a very strategic location, a half mile off the shore. It's only accessible by foot during low tide. It was besieged more than once, but never ever taken. Why? Because it was a place of protection, a place of fortification. Like any strong castle, it was built on a higher elevation with a strong foundation. And I want you to know today, 
today that if Jesus is king of your castle, your family and your posterity will impact a kingdom that will last for eternity. And that ought to be the goal of every family. But the only way we can say that our family will be like a castle that will impact time and eternity, that will stand against the test of tribulation, that will stand against the test of difficulties and trials and and all the things that we face today, the storm surges of life, if in fact Jesus is the king of our castle. Every single castle has a king. And it must be King Jesus. Now, what exactly does that even mean? Psalm 128 is what we're going to study today. If you have a copy of God's Word, Psalm 128, another wisdom psalm. We get God's wisdom for how we can build a family with a strong foundation and an eternal destination. Look what it says in Psalm 128, verse 1. It says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Practically, what's that mean? To make Jesus the king of your castle, the king of your home. To make him the ruler, the Lord, the leader of your life. It means we're going to walk in his ways. See, at this very moment, you're either walking in your own way or you're walking in God's ways. You're either walking in the world's ways or you're walking according to God's ways. And what it says is blessed is everyone who will fear the Lord. What's that mean to live in the fear of the Lord? It means I'm going to walk in his ways. There is a different way God says that you can have a family that truly is successful for time and eternity, but you have to decide who's going to sit on the throne of your home, and it begins by letting Jesus sit on the throne of your heart. I'm going to walk in the fear of the Lord, meaning I'm going to walk in his ways. Now, we talked last time about castles. They have gates. We've talked a lot about the walls. Walls are for protection, but the gates are for preparation. A, 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 a castle without gates is simply a prison. The goal is not to keep our kids in the home like it's a prison. The goal is to one day lure the gates so that they can go out into the world and make a kingdom impact for Jesus. They can have their own family. They can have their own marriage and live a life that is holy, happy, and healthy. That's the goal. So I want to talk today about the walls. We've talked a lot about that, protection, and protecting our kids in the early days when they're young and most impressionable. But I want you to know, if your goal as a parent is simply to keep them behind the walls of your home, you're going to raise safe kids. You're not going to raise strong kids. And the goal is not simply to raise safe kids, it's to raise strong kids. So today I want to talk about the gates. Listen carefully. There's only one king of your castle. It's got to be Jesus but you are the gatekeeper as a mama and a daddy. And the gatekeeper in any castle had a very important position. He had to decide when to lower the gates and when to raise the gates. And the hardest thing about parenting is to know how much, how fast, and how soon to start lowering the gates, to let your children be out in the world and start being exposed to the difficulties and dangers of the world because only out there are they forced to begin exercising their spiritual muscles against the external forces of the world. And as they have to exercise their spiritual muscles in a hostile world, only then can they become strong and not merely safe. And so we've kind of broken it down like this. Walls are for protection and gates are for preparation. In the early days, if you have little ones, uh, you to protect them, meaning you have high control over who influences them, uh, the people they meet, the, the, the people they get to hang around because these influences are, are deeply shaping their hearts. And we know that by the time a human being is 10 or 12 years of age, who they are in terms of their worldview and their core values has already been deeply embedded and deeply shaped. Now, what happens today? I want to talk about this. If you have, say, a fourth, fifth, sixth graders, right? They're starting to emerge into adolescence. How do you begin wisely and carefully lowering the gates. That's what I want to talk about, how to prepare them. In the early days, it's the age of protection. Now, you should have this in your handout. It's also in our Castles curriculum. I hope every family here eventually goes through our Castles discipleship curriculum. It's going to far outlast the series of sermons that I'm preaching for years and years to come. Uh, We've developed this content into a family discipleship curriculum. 
where you're going to see how to walk the path. And we've defined the win as a parent. The win is an acronym. Walk the path. And there are 10 mile markers that we have produced for you to help you put yourself on the journey, place yourself in the path, and to know exactly what you're trying to accomplish in that season of your child's life. Uh, the I in win is initiate faith conversations. Uh, proactively. Why? Because as a parent, you can do what your children's pastor cannot do. See, at church, we can access your child's head, but as a parent, you get to access their heart. See, it's not in the church house, it's in your house that will deeply shape them. So, as you begin to initiate faith conversations with them, and then the end and the win is never miss a God moment. What you're trying to do in the early days is protect them, meaning you have high parental control and then gradually, you are opening the gate, slowly, prayerfully, and carefully. So by the, by the time they're 18 years of age and they leave your home, you have no control and they have complete control. They have complete autonomy. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have influence. My children today are in their 20s. you think I have any control over what my kids do or don't do? No, they're grown-ups now. But I can trust them with that control. You know why? Because I walked the path before I even knew that's what we called it. You've got to live and parent with intention, having a sense of destination. Where are you trying to take them? So that one day, as you swing the gates wide open, they can leave your home. Now they have complete control. Now, as a parent of adults, you still want to have influence. I still have influence in the life of my 20-something children, but I don't have control. And that is the goal, that you slowly let go of control and give away more and more control so that they can ultimately be healthy and happy and grow up to live in maturity in this world that is increasingly difficult to live for Jesus. So I just want you to think about this, doing it with intention. Listen, you would not remotely consider giving the keys to the family car to your 10-year-old. Well, would you? Yeah, they're not ready for that kind of responsibility. Yeah, there, 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 there is a growing that has to happen first, a maturing before you trust them with the keys of the family car. You wouldn't do that with a 10-year-old. Why then would you give your 10-year-old a smartphone? I'm trying to tell you, when you do that, you're throwing the gates wide open. You don't want to have any control over the influences that are coming into their life. And I'm trying to tell you, there's a lot of kids that get in lots of trouble. They are being led to captivity and slavery because they're encountering pornography earlier and earlier and earlier and doing it on their phone. And that's why we're raising a generation of men and women in captivity and slavery. It happens younger and younger and younger. You've got to be. I'm not telling you what to do. I can't be the one. It's not the same for all your children. Your children are different. I'm just trying to tell you, when you give your kid a smartphone, an iPhone, I don't all the controls. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm telling you. They will find a way that you don't know. So I'm just saying, be wise. Be prayerful. Be careful. How fast you're lowering those gates. Now, your kids are fourth, fifth, maybe sixth grade, somewhere in their pre-adolescence. This is when you start lowering the gates. They have to begin to navigate a hostile world if they're gonna be strong and stand for Jesus. And that is the goal. We've shaped them, now we're aiming them. And one day very soon you're gonna release them. I wanna talk about the age now of preparation. Say they're teenage years, from middle school, teen. What are you trying to do as a parent in that season of life? Number one, you wanna give them a sense of identity. Give them a sense of identity. And this begins in the age of protection. I talked last time, while they're still just a toddler, they need to be taught who I am is defined by whose I am. You understand, we live in a generation that's having an identity crisis. An identity crisis. We live at a time where even educated, sophisticated Americans can't define what is a woman. This is not a hard question to answer. It shouldn't be that hard. Yet we're having an identity crisis in U.S. society. Why? Because self-idolatry always leads to a distorted sense of identity. See, we've not taught a generation that I am God's and because I'm created by him and I'm created for him that he gets to define who I am. Who I am is defined by whose I am. But consequently, what we've taught a generation is you're God. 
See, we live in a time of self-idolatry, self-deity. The world revolves around me. I can make me. I have my own identity. And you see, self-idolatry is what has created a distorted sense of identity. I don't know who I am. And that's why it's so important. It begins early that we teach our little children that you are made by God, created by God. You belong to God, and only God gets to define your identity. Only God gets to define who you are. You are a child of God. You're not just my child, son. You're God's child, right? Now, what happens is they get older. Now they have some maturity. They can start to put some handles on this. And this is where in my house we would have on occasion family roundtables. My kids were three years apart. I have three of them, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. We started having some kind of family roundtable discussions about the Hopper family core values. I don't know if you realize this or not, but as a human being, you have a set of core values, whether you know what they are or not. Your core values, they are your ethos for living. They're your DNA, not just physically, but of who you are, your your worldview, your your vision. See, we do what we do because we is what we is. It's your identity inwardly that is reflected in your activity outwardly. So core values, they're more than what you do, they're what you are. So I started giving my kids a sense of identity. What does it mean to be a hopper? to carry that hopper name. More importantly, what's it mean to be a Christian, to carry the name above every name that is named, the name of Jesus? So this is how we define our core values. Now you can use these, you can steal these, or you can come up with your own, doesn't matter, but you wanna give your kids at this age a sense of identity. Who am I? And this is what we did in the Hopper home. We defined our core values, and we did this as a family, and this was kind of a family process of them beginning to assimilate character qualities into their life that would be part of their identity, the Hopper family values. We came up with these as a family, integrity. And we would talk about integrity. What is integrity? I said, son, listen, we're not gonna do anything privately that could shame the name of Jesus publicly. See, integrity is not how you live when everybody's watching. No, your integrity is what you do when nobody's watching. Integrity is tested when you could get away with doing what is wrong, yet you still choose to do what is right. So integrity was one of our Hopper family core values. Humility was one of our family values. We said, hey, we're not going to act like we're better than anybody. We're not better than anybody. Uh, humility, uh, 1 Peter 5, 5, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humility says, I need God that I need him, that I'm not too proud to admit I need him. Humility became one of our core values. I actually had these framed and put on each of their bedroom walls just to remind them every day of who they are. This is part of their identity, tenacity, tenacity. We talked about tenacity being one of our core values as a family. Tenacity says we're going to have a never give up mentality. We will never retreat in the face of adversity. Guys, life is going to be hard, and you're one of going to give up, you want to give in, but tenacity says, I'm going to stay and fight and do what is right, even when I'd rather walk away. I'm trying to raise resilient children that can get knocked down but get back up again. Uh, we talked about serving sacrificially. We live in the selfie society where it's all about me. You're never more like Christ than when you make it all about others. Jesus said the Son of Man himself did not come to be served but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And so we started talking about living a life for others, not living a life simply for ourselves. And we began serving together as a family. See, this is more caught than it is simply taught. Your children will become not what you say, but as much what they see. Because they may not always hear what you say, but I will promise they will always see what you are. Now, it doesn't mean you've got to be perfect. Your children do not need perfect parents. They need parents that are real. Meaning, I had a habit of saying, guys, I am so sorry. You just saw daddy lose his cool. I am so sorry I got angry. That's what they need. They don't need to see that you're perfect because that's a bar nobody can hit. But they need to see that you're shooting for this in your own life, that you're trying to embody this in your own life. Serving sacrificially, our last one was doing everything for God's glory. Guys, it is not for our fame. It is not for our name. We want to bring all glory to God. We were created by him, and we were created for him. And one day when we're all gone, I pray that people remember 
Jesus' name. That, that, that is what we came up with as a family. That became part of our family identity, still is today. So this is what you begin doing as you start lowering those gates. Now, the second thing is this. You want to give them a higher vision personally. In other words, you want to give them a sense of destination. You start calling them up into adulthood while they're still in child. What does it mean to be a real man? Now, I read a book many years ago as a young father that was very formative in my own life as I began to shape parenting, what I believed about parenting, and how I could succeed in the life of my kids. And, and uh, it was a book by a guy named Dr. Robert Lewis. It was entitled Raising a Modern Day Knight. And that's what we're trying to do in the life of our children. He illustrated how in the ancient days, when people really lived in castles, there was a real intention behind raising knights. As a seven-year-old little boy, he would become what's called a page, and he would be sent away to begin training in these character qualities of chivalry, of integrity, of nobility. And then at 14 years of age, he'd become what's called a squire, and he'd be personally mentored then by a knight and weaponry and armory. He was the one that was going to defend the kingdom. You understand, there's coming a day that our little knights are going to leave our castle and defend the kingdom and advance the kingdom and bring glory to the king. That's the goal. By the way, in medieval days, there were orders of female knights. <laughs> doesn't matter if you have daughters or sons. So uh, I came up with uh, this definition with the help of Dr. Robert Lewis for my son. This became the definition. I would teach them what it means to be a real man. How do you know if you cross the finish line, you finally become a man? Because I know 40-year-old men that are still teenagers inwardly. They have a grown man's body, but they haven't grown up inwardly. How do you know when you've finally grown up? A real man rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, and expects the greater reward, God's reward. We began talking about that definition of manhood. It became part of the language in our house. My son, he's in ninth grade. He needs to go mow the lawn. I told him to go mow the lawn two hours ago, but he's still watching TV. Son, are you accepting responsibility? Became part of the language. Uh, it's Sunday afternoon. They still haven't done their homework. Son, you got homework to do? Turn off the TV. Reject passivity. Now you have daughters. I, 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 don't, I didn't have the definition given to me of a real woman. Come up with your own. Something like a real woman rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, puts on the beauty of virtue and humility, and loves and nurtures her family. I just made that up. I actually get to say, a Pastor Phil original, you can use it. It's not copyrighted. Come up with your own definition. It doesn't matter. But you need to come up with a definition because that definition becomes the destination. You tracking? See, so this is how you start calling them up into adulthood. Uh, and if you walk the path, and you'll see these 10 mile markers in the castle's curriculum, one of the mile markers is to mark the moment. The Jews have a bar mitzvah. A lot of ancient cultures, tribal cultures, they, they have a ceremony, a coming-of-age ceremony. Traditionally, we have no such thing. And so you need to mark the moment in some way where you start calling your children from childhood into adulthood. I did that for each of my children. Uh, and my oldest son, Jake, we, we had what I called a sword ceremony. Life of honor, integrity, and tenacity. I will seek to be Christ-like in my servanthood and sacrifice for others. And I promise to follow my father's guidance and wise counsel as he prepares me to be a man. The sword pretty much is a sign that um, I am to not give in and not give up. And even when it's, what, it's easier to go away and you wouldn't even get caught for anything, um, that you stay and fight and it's a sign of the warrior part of you. Lord, this I pray for Jake, that he would become a courageous, godly, fearless man for you, that you would prosper him, and that your hand would be upon him. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's hear it for Jake. <laughs> I want you to notice a couple of things. Number one, I wasn't there by myself. There's a moment your kids need community. This is why our fusion group ministry, our student ministry is so important. 
Because there's a moment your voice alone will not be enough. Yes, your mom, your dad, you have the most influence in your life of your child, you should. But there's a moment that won't be enough. You need to bring them into community. You saw other men there with me and other sons that were there. We raised our boys together. We raised our children together in a community of men. And same thing if you have daughters. You need some other women to bring them in and some other girls. You're all trying to do the same thing together in that season. Now, i got to tell you, I didn't do everything right. I did not do everything right. One of the things I did wrong is I'm a very idealistic person, admittedly. There's idealism and then there's realism. In my idealism, I expected Jake to act like a grown man when he was in middle school. And it was so frustrating uh, you know, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. I don't know how many times I would say, son, it's time to put away childish things. Quit picking on your sister. Uh, quit bullying your little brother. Put away childish things. I was so frustrated. At one point, he was about 16 years of age. I was so frustrated. It was the fog of war. It doesn't look like anything I thought it would. And I'm so exasperated. I said, Jake, you signed a covenant. You promised to listen to your father. You promised to heed my counsel. He says, I didn't know what I was signing. (laughs) 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 I bet he reads the fine print next time. (laughs) Yeah, he didn't know what he was signing. He was in seventh grade. Listen, I learned a little bit because I held off with his younger brother about 18 months. I did something similar, but I didn't do it when he was going into seventh grade. I did it when he was going into ninth grade. Why? Because there's a maturity level. He didn't fully understand what he was signing, right? So this is the hard part of parenting, of opening the gates. There's no book, chapter, and verse in the Bible to tell you exactly what to do when your kid is this age. Exactly, you're, you're kind of feeling your way through this. You're managing this tension of lowering the gates, not too fast, not too slow. And if you have multiple kids, and a lot of us do, they're not all the same. What worked for one is not exactly what's going to work for the next one. But I'm trying to tell you, you do it with intention. That is the key. You're shaping them. Now you're aiming them for a specific destination. One day you're going to release them. And you're going for the long-term return. You may not see the results immediately. I thought I would. I didn't. It's the long-term return on investment. And that's what you're trying to do then as a parent. Now the next thing is this. Give them a sense of mission eternally. Why do a lot of kids walk away from the faith? I'll tell you why I walked away from the faith. I've been raised in a Christian home. I've been raised in a godly family. I went to a church that taught the right things theologically. I became a prodigal. I temporarily walked away from the faith. I'll tell you why. Because Jesus was just academic. I knew all the right things. I knew all the answers. I knew all the Bible stories. I knew I needed Jesus to get to heaven, but I wouldn't plan on going to heaven. Not right away. Someday. I was taught to come to church, sit and listen. Nobody told me there was a mission. Lots of people on the platform got to live a mission. I don't know the preacher. I didn't know I get to. I mean, I, I, I have a mission. If Jesus is just academic, it's not going to be enough for, for our kids to grow up and passionately pursue Jesus. If it's just about knowledge, We need to give them a ringside seat at the battle when they're little, and as they begin to grow, we need to give them a piece of the battle. We need to insert them into the battle. We would take our kids on mission trips, took them to Central America a number of times in the early days. It's easier than it's ever been. You you don't want to leave the country. You can now take your family to minister the gospel to the nations without even leaving your city. Four weekends a year, we have something called Live Sent, where we go minister the gospel to different ethnic groups that have come right here to the Kansas City area. There's all kinds of ways to do this, but it's so important that you teach them that following Jesus is not just about having the right theology, it's about living for a mission that will last eternally. Matthew 6, seek you first the kingdom of God. I'm here to advance the kingdom of God. So consider family mission trips and opportunities to serve the Lord as a family. Be a part of our welcome team on Sunday morning and bring your kids with you. Let them 
them serve with you because it's more caught than it really is taught. Now, the next thing is this. Prepare them for life practically. You're opening the gates. They're emerging now. They're in ninth grade. They're just a few years away from graduating. How are you preparing them practically to succeed in all areas of life that they're going to need to succeed? You have windows in a castle. You have walls. You have gates. But there's also windows. And those windows give an elevated view of the world from the safety of the castle. You're letting them view view the window through the window of your home into the world where they can see farther than they could possibly see. And you're talking about what's out there before they actually have to get out there. So from inside your home, you're giving them an elevated view of how they're going to navigate the difficulties of life and the things that the world is going to throw at them. So talk to them openly about sex and how to win against temptation and how to succeed with money and marriage and career, etc. I'm telling you guys, if you're not talking to your kids about sex, somebody else is going to. The world will be happy to disciple your children. So I'm just trying to tell you, by the time they're in fourth grade, if you think they're not thinking about sex, nobody wants to think my kid is a sexual creature. He is. He's going to talk to somebody. I wanted my kids to talk to me. So by the time they're fourth grade, I, I told them everything, and I mean everything. I mean everything. Because I wanted them to know, yeah, it made them turn red, made me turn red, and it's not a one and done. It begins a running dialogue as you're trying to get them to the altar of marriage with a healthy, holy heart so they can have a healthy, happy marriage. So many children get caught in captivity sexually through pornography and dating randomly and all the things that come with that. No, no, no. I wanted to prepare my kids to win. That's why I talk to them. When you talk to your kids about sex, you're teaching them, we can talk about anything. You can't wait till a kid is 16 to try to get him to open up to you. You want him to talk to you when you're 16? You got to talk to him when he's 10. Initiate those faith conversations. You be the one. And then the when, the end, is never miss a God moment. The greatest teaching moments come on the ones you're not expecting. You don't know when they're going to come. It's a God moment in, in your child's life. You're opening the gates. For the first time, my son is going to public school. We homeschooled in the early years. Uh, we public education in the latter years. Uh, we kept them behind the walls. In the, I'm not saying you have to do it this way. I'm saying that's what we did. So we start swinging the gates open. Kids are going to public school. For the first time in his life, Jake found somebody that didn't like him. <laughs> what do I do? I mean, everybody I've ever met loves me. They like me. He goes to this little school, and he begins to upset the social structure that's there. And, uh, you know, there's a little boy that starts to target him because all of a sudden there's this new kid in school, and he's kind of upsetting the social structure. He begins to target him, kind of starts to bully him and begin to ostracize him. And Jake comes home. He's upset. I don't know what to do. And I'll tell you the first thing I did. I thought a couple of things before I said it. The first thing you want to do is bring them home, protect them. Don't let them feel the pain, protect them. Get them back to the castle where they can be safe, but that will not make them strong. No, that's not the thing to do. This is a God moment. Help them navigate a God moment that will define the future. The second thing I thought that I almost said, son, tomorrow at recess. <laughs> I want you to punch him right in the nose. If you get expelled, I'll come get you, and we will go to ice cream. I really did. I almost said, <laughs> that was almost my response. Now listen, I'm not going to say a time that would never be the wrong response. There is a time to fight. I taught my kid, my son, there's a time to fight. You never fight unless you have to. But if you have to fight, you fight like you're the third monkey on the ramp going up to Noah's Ark, and brother, it is starting to rain. <laughs> But not yet, all right? Okay, the Spirit of God gets a hold of me. I'm ready to speak now. Romans chapter 12, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Never miss a God moment. We're going to navigate this God moment together. Son, he might become an enemy. You can't win everybody. But let's try to make him a friend. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a family bowling and pizza night, and you're going to invite him. 
His first response was, Dad! He said, son, I'm serious. That's exactly what we did. He invites this little guy to come with us, bowling, pizza. He befriends him. Check this out. He later wins him to Christ. I don't know if he still is, but a few years ago, he was going to Paradigm, our young adult ministry, on Tuesday nights. That's what God did. He taught him how to navigate a difficult decision. These uh, never miss a God moment. Another one came when he's in seventh grade. I've been gone all day. My wife calls me. You could cut the air with a knife over the phone. Honey, what is wrong? What is going on? She had found pictures on my computer of Taylor Swift and the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. I get home, I'm like, honey, I promise, I don't know. I have no idea. I really, really, I don't know. They're not mine. But it's very incriminating. It's on my computer. And I, I say these words that come out of my mouth. I said, look, honey, this is middle school stuff. Like grown men looking at pictures they shouldn't aren't looking at women with their clothes on. I literally say this. This is middle school stuff. And then it hit me. Jake! <laughs> now, this is a God moment. Tears. He confesses immediately. Your next move will define the future. What a lot of us were raised with is, I can't believe you would do that. I am so ashamed of you. We think shame is going to motivate our kids to live a holy life. Shame drives them into secrecy. Your next move is real important. You know what I said, son? It's normal. What you're going through is normal. Your dad went through it too. Now here's what happens. If you keep pursuing this, eventually one thing leads to the next thing, and you're going to be looking at the wrong things, and now you're going to be in slavery to pornography. So it's really important that we establish some accountability. And you need to know, your dad needs this too. You never grow out of the need to guard your eyes. And by guarding your eyes, you're guarding your heart. See, now you take away the weapon from the enemy, which is secrecy and shame. And check this out. He invited me into his sex life. We developed a trust that we could talk about anything. And today we still do as men, man to man. Son, how are you doing? How are you and Abby doing? This is the goal. As they navigate this minefield that they're navigating as teenagers. And they can win with a mom and a dad that's helping them navigate these difficult situations that a lot of us, we didn't have anybody to lead us through. That's what I was hoping to do. Give them the family blessing. This is the last thing. Give them the family blessing before they leave the house. What is the family blessing? It's found in Psalm 128, verse 1. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. The family blessing is found when we fear the Lord and we walk in his ways. This is the blessing that was given to me by my mother and my father. This is the blessing I've handed to my children that I pray one day they will hand to their children. A family that is blessed, divinely blessed, is a family that fears the Lord, that walks in his ways. Look at what it says now in verse 2. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house, and your children like olive plants all around your table. Now, I don't have time to talk about this, but the implication, gentlemen, you and I are the gardeners of our home. If you want your family to be a fruitful garden, if you want your wife to bloom like a fruitful vine... You can't expect her to act like a spring flower if you're always blowing in winter weather. That's all I got time for right there. I got to move on. Now watch this. If you have created a spiritual greenhouse, uh, you're, you're the one that keeps the thermostat exactly just right. And it may be stormy and nasty outside, but it's warm inside. You've got the sunlight, the S-O-N light, <laughs> You've got the oxygen of the Holy Spirit. Need I go on? Your children are going to be like olive plants around your table. What on earth does that mean? Well, if you're an ancient Hebrew, you know exactly what that means. 
but we're not ancient Hebrews. We don't have olive trees in this part of the world, but they do. Olive trees are everywhere. An olive tree never dies. An olive tree lives hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of years. You know why? Because when one part of the tree dies, another part of the tree comes alive. An olive tree is always putting on new shoots and new growth. As one part dies, a new part of the tree is coming alive. And that's how it goes on and on and on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. Someday, maybe not this year like we were going to, not sure yet, we're going to go back to Israel. And you're going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Some of those trees date almost from the time of Christ. Almost. Because if one part of that tree dies, another part's coming alive. See, that is the implication. Like an aging olive tree, your family tree spiritually will live on in your children and your children's children. And friends, that is the goal of all of us, is to have a family tree like an olive tree that will live on long after our lives. And you see, we're learning that our life lives on in our children and their children's children. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. That is the second time in the space of four verses God reminds us, if you want to be blessed, you must fear the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Now the implication in the ancient days is that if Jerusalem was at peace, our family Families are at peace. That's what God wants for your family, a family that is at peace. If you're watching the news, and most of you are, you know that right now Jerusalem is not at peace. Jerusalem is at war. And I'm in a whole message, two weeks from today, a whole message from this platform on what is going on in Israel right now. So many of you have asked, so many of you want to know. We're going to put the, 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 the dots together. We're going to see prophetically, biblically, what is going on and why. I'm going to answer that question two weeks from today. I do it next week. We're going to baptize and do communion. All right? But the implication here is the good of Jerusalem. The implication is Jerusalem is at peace. Bless you out of Zion. Zion is the mountain on which Jerusalem is built, the heavenly Zion, the new Jerusalem. What he's saying is God will bless your family from Zion as in heaven in a way that will forever impact your family on earth. And that should be all of our desires that you may see your children's children and have a lasting legacy a family tree that will echo and ring forever, for all of eternity. You're going to hear me now read another letter that I wrote to my son on the night before he was married. Jake, it is so hard to believe you're getting married. It seems like just yesterday you were a toddler riding your first bike. But life really is a vapor, and the older I get, the more I see the reality of the brevity of life. I'm so glad that you've decided to live your life for things that matter, that last forever, full throttle. Love passionately and live fearlessly. You're a man of destiny to make an impact in time and eternity. A real man rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, and expects the greater reward, God's reward. Jake, I wouldn't tell you this if it were not true, but you have become a real man in every sense of the word. Nothing can ever be more fulfilling as a father but to live to see your little boy grow up to be a real man. You embody integrity, tenacity, honor, and humility. Jake, I'm so proud of you that you have proved yourself a man. You're going to be a great husband. We are to embody the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus lives in you. And he is both lion and lamb. And that is why in your heart dwells a lion and a lamb. We're to be a warrior and a lover. And you become a great warrior. And you become a great lover. A lover of people. And I don't know if you remember, you probably do, but there was a sword I gave you when you were just in seventh grade. You turned 13 and I wanted to start casting a vision of what it means to be a man and I engraved on that sword the definition of a real man. Say this with me, a real man rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, 
and expects the greater reward, God's reward. And we hung that on your wall, and I was hoping it'd be a reminder of what it meant to be a man. You remember how many times I got so frustrated when you were a teenager because you'd be picking on your brother or teasing your sister and acting selfishly instead of selflessly? And a couple of times I marched up the stairs and I took that thing off your wall because you didn't deserve the sword. And then you left home after your senior year, and I don't know that we ever put that sword back on your wall. And it's been our basement now for years. But Josiah's gonna bring that sword up here now because I'm convinced today you deserve the sword, son. Remember to treat Abby like she is the most priceless and treasured person on earth. Her worth is far above rubies. Treat her like she is a rare priceless gem and she will only become more beautiful and more fruitful. I love you, son. I am more proud of you than you can imagine. You have become more than my son. You are now my brother. And may God bless you and the Lord keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Your dad. So many of you are in the fog of war and you're right in the middle of it. And you wonder if it's worth it. And I'm trying to tell you, on the other side of the fog, it is worth it. It's worth the hard work. It's worth whatever it takes. And I want to pray for you right now, wherever you are in the world, church houses, other campuses in our city, right here in Lee Summit. I want you to stand with me right now. I want to pray over every mama, every daddy, every grandma, every grandpa. The thousands of people standing right now. Moms and dads represent tens of thousands of children and grandchildren. And I believe God hears our prayer. I believe that there is a heavenly Zion. And the blessing of heaven can come to earth when men of God and women of God fear the Lord. So as we end this series, I pray that it would live on for years and years and years. For some of us, your next step should be to sign up for castles the family discipleship, begin to really assimilate some of this into your life and your home. But right now I wanna pray, would you bow with me? I wanna pray over you and for you. God in heaven, you see these men and women standing. Godly men, godly women, godly fathers and mothers and grandmas and grandpas. And Lord, we petition you for our sons and daughters, for our children and our children's children. May they be as all of plants around our table. That will live on long after we're gone. In these difficult days that are increasingly hostile to the gospel, I pray that we would raise children who are more than safe, that are strong, that are holy and healthy that will make a difference in time and eternity. I pray blessing, God, over these families. Help us to fear the Lord, to walk in his ways, to teach our children to do the same. And may you bless them out of Zion. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you give Jesus the glory with me today? Praise him, would you?